Once Perry had his plans, he contracted workers at Mojave to build the wagons. He ordered 10 freighters at $900 each and five water wagons with iron tanks. The wagon beds were 16 feet long by six feet high. The front wheels were five feet in diameter and the rear wheels were seven feet. The iron tires were an inch thick and eight inches wide to handle the sandy desert surface. Each wagon weighed 7,800 pounds. They were hitched in pairs and could carry up to 11 tons each. Periodically along the route, one of the five 1,200 gallon water tanks would be filled at a spring and hauled to the next dry camp. When the two freight wagons and a water wagon were hitched in tandem and all fully loaded, the entire outfit weighed 73,000 pounds or 36 and a half tons. Years later, they were touted as the largest wagons ever built. But John Perry knew better. There were other wagons just as large. To pull the loaded wagons through the desert, mules were the obvious choice. They are a sterile animal, the result of pairing a female horse with a male donkey. The mule, said one enthusiast, is courageous and intelligent. In fact, a dumb mule, if there is such a thing, is smarter than a smart horse. But most important, mules were able to adapt to the desert climate and didn't require as much water as a horse. But sometimes there were two horses, the wheelers, closest to the wagons often large draft horses whose weight and strength helped in pulling the wagons. The mules were stretched out in pairs for 120 feet. A reporter later wrote, the most civilized pair of mules were in the lead. The next most intelligent were in the back, just ahead of the horses. In between were all the sinful, the fun-loving, and the rawhides. The lead mules wore bells. The bells warned other teams on the road and provided a rhythm for the mules to pull to. For the mules in the back of the team who could not see the leader, the bells calmed and reassured them that their leader was still there. Operating a 20 mule team was done by two men, the teamster and the swamper. The swamper got his name from the men who cleared swamps in the logging camps of the Northwest. On desert freighters, the swamper made sure the equipment worked and most importantly, operated the brake on the second wagon. The teamster drove the mules and cared for them. He either rode on top of the front wagon or on the wheeler, the left horse or mule next to the wagon tongue. To control the front wagon, the teamster pulled a rope to work the brake. Controlling the team was done with another rope, which stretched all the way to the lead mule. This rope was called a jerk line. A steady pull on the line, sometimes with the shout of, ha, ah! made the mule in front, the lead or line mule, turn the team to the left. A series of jerks with the shout of, gee, and the lead mule jerked his head, turning the team to the right. For motivation, the teamster sometimes used the crackling sound of a black snake whip or tossed pebbles at the rumps of lazy mules. According to one awestruck reporter, it was the experience of a lifetime to see the teamster gather in the slack of a jerk line, loosen the ponderous brake, and awaken the dormant energies of the team. It was this combination of mules, men, horses, and wagons that was later dubbed the 20 mule team. It was certainly easier to say than 18 mule and two horse team, and in later years there was no one to dispute how many mules or horses there were anyway. None of the original drivers left any memoirs, and those who lived long enough to see the 20 mule team become famous bragged without challenge. Even Death Valley Scotty, known for his secret gold mine and castle, claimed to have worked on the 20 mule teams, though there is no official record. And then there was Ed Stiles. 
Ed told a reporter the story of the first 20 mule team. One day, we took a new wagon the company just brought in and coupled it to my heavy wagon. Then we took a third wagon and coupled it to the rear as a trailer to carry water and feed for the animals. The 12 mule team I'd been driving was brought from the corral and lined up in harness two by two as usual. Then, eight mules from another driver were strung out in front of them. The other teamster knew he would no longer be driving his eight mules and his driving days were through. But for me, it was some time later before I realized that I had hooked up the first 20 mule team outfit. But long line teams of 20 mules and even more had been used all over the West. In the 1870s, local businessmen in southern Arizona used freighters with two or three wagons pulled by 12 to 20 mules. In the Searles Valley, west of Death Valley, Remy Nadeau's freighters used long line teams. Even Francis Smith and other borax operators in Nevada were using big teams of mules more than 10 years before the Death Valley operation. But Coleman and Perry had done their research, deciding on long line teams and large wagons. They now faced the practical task of using their mules and new wagons to haul the borax to the railroad. 